Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash I Know Dino. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your Android device, iPhone, Kindle, or MP3 player. And we also want to give a big shout out to our patrons at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. We really appreciate your support. In this episode, we have an interview with Dr. Scott Persons, and we might be the first people to have interviewed him since he got his doctorate. Congratulations. Yeah, it's awesome. And we have our dinosaur of the day, Shishiosaurus, and a bunch of dinosaur news. There's some really exciting news, so we're going to start with that. There's a new paper by Lida Shing and others published in Nature and it describes two incredible new finds that were in amber. Specifically, they found two mummified baby dinosaur slash bird wings from about 99 million years ago, which is the mid-Cretaceous. So the specimens come from the Angbamo site in Myanmar, and so the amber that they're in is called Burmese amber, which fluoresces blue when bombarded with UV light, which is one of the techniques they used to make sure that it was a legitimate find and not some sort of forgery. They're actually not the first feathers that were found in amber, but they are the first dinosaur wings that we've ever seen preserved. And they're not complete wings, both of them start partway down the ulna and radius, but that still leaves a lot of the wing left in the amber because part of the wing is that their hand kind of gets bigger. So if you imagine your arm with like a bigger hand and then part way up your upper arm that's still most of the wing so it's pretty cool the two samples are remarkably small though both of them are about one centimeter long and wide which is like 0.4 inches so they're super tiny and even though they're so small they have really awesome details after inspection they see that the wings have the same types of feathers as modern birds which are rows of asymmetric flight feathers, and we hadn't really known for sure that they had those before. And in addition to the bones and the feathers, you can also see skin and muscle through the amber. And after doing a CT scan, they got a good view of the bones, and they were able to compare them to other known species of dinosaurs from around that time period. So they are believed to be enantiornaths, which are a diverse group of small birds from the Cretaceous that mostly had claws at the end of their wings and teeth. And these wings did have little claws at the end too. And the entire group of enantiorns went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous along with most of the other dinosaurs. So this wing did not eventually evolve into a modern bird most likely, but Its shared ancestor with modern birds, obviously, had already developed those asymmetric feathers that are needed for flight. Both of the specimens, when you look at them, basically look like they're black in the amber, but the amber is yellow, so you have to look at bits of the feather that are really close to the surface of the amber. And when the scientists did that, they said they're slightly different in color, and that one is dark walnut brown and the other is black brown. I guess is very slight difference. Slightly different, yeah. But since they're almost 100 million years old, the original color is probably different and they have probably gone through some kind of decomposition. But unfortunately, they couldn't find a good exposed sample of the feather to look at under an SEM so they could check for melanosomes. And they didn't want to destroy the specimen by cutting it up and everything. They'd rather leave it in the amber. So we're not sure exactly what color it used to be. Luckily, though, they could see a little bit of patterning on the wing where there were some lighter patches on both of the wings. And they appear to show up in about the same places. So it's likely that they might be from the same species. Both of the specimens are being kept in the amber collection at the Dexu Institute of Paleontology in China. The craziest thing about this find, though, is that it was almost completely lost. Apparently, the valley where the amber was found is in the Kaichin state of Myanmar, 
but it's under control of the Kaichin Independence Army, which effectively prevents regulation of Burmese amber in the region. And most of that amber is sold to Chinese customers as jewelry, and one of the wings was nearly turned into a pendant that was going to be called Angel Wings. So hmm. that specimen is now unofficially nicknamed Angel. Luckily, Xing and his research team bought the fossil in an amber market in the capital of the Kaichin state before it was sold. It appears that Angel was broken off a larger piece, leading to the possibility that the whole wing or even oh. the entire bird may have originally been in amber before having the wing removed for jewelry. That's too bad. Yeah. There is an initiative for local universities to start checking amber for scientific value before they are damaged, but that hasn't happened yet, and it would need some pretty good support from the government, and it would probably need to resolve this whole who controls that valley in Myanmar and, you know, restoring order. But still an awesome discovery. It's really cool that they found these wings and that these birds 99 million years ago that didn't even descend into modern birds had such similar wings to modern birds. It's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Next in the news, in Thailand, paleontologists Varavud Sutinhorn and Eric Bouftat led a team to excavate Phu Noi. And in 2008, when they started, they found 20 dinosaur bone fragments. And over the years, they found a thousand sauropod bone fragments, a carnosauria jaw, as well as bits of bones from mammals and turtles and a freshwater shark. The dinosaur fossils they found were from more than 100 million years ago, which means those dinosaurs disappeared before the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. It's not clear yet why, so the team continues to look at multiple sites for more fossils for a possible explanation. And according to Varavud, quote, dinosaurs lived on the earth very successfully for a long period of time, but they went extinct eventually. That should serve as a warning for us as humans to look at the way we are living, to look at the way we are trying to change the course of nature, end quote. There's some geological evidence that the dinosaurs that disappeared in Thailand were due to environmental changes and climate change, such as a sudden drought of their floodplains and also a major flooding in other areas caused by rising sea levels that, according to the Bangkok Post article, quote, caused salt water to become locked in the northeast lowlands, creating a kind of salt lake, end quote. Some of the bones in Thailand are similar to bones found in China, which may mean that these dinosaurs migrated north. Quote, the extinction of the dinosaurs may not be the most severe. Surevich Satithorn, who is Varavut's son and an academic at Mahasarakam University, said. He also said, quote, it took around 1,000 years for them to reach extinction. Humans may be at a point that lead to mass extinction much sooner. If we can unlock the mystery of the dinosaurs, we may be able to adapt and survive, end quote. More dinosaurs are being discovered in Thailand. At least nine species have been found so far. And that's partly because of the Fossil Protection Act of 2008 that allowed officials to enforce laws to protect dinosaur fossils. Dinosaurs are starting to become bigger in Thailand, and one of the cool things that's coming out is the new theme park, the Sarenhor Museum and Dinosaur Planet, which we've talked about in earlier episodes. It opened up in March of this year. Yeah, it always helps to get public opinion on the side of the science and the value of the dinosaur research in order to help preserve things and get more discoveries going. Definitely. Next, the Smithsonian Magazine did this interesting feature on Baron Franz Nowska von Felsa Silvas, who was an Austro-Hungarian aristocrat born in 1877, and he was a, quote, explorer, spy, polyglot, and master of disguise, end quote, who was almost crowned king of Albania at one point. Hmm. Really interesting guy. He was also a scientist and one of the first people to see dinosaurs as social creatures and having an evolutionary relationship with birds. And he became obsessed with dinosaurs in 1895 when his sister found a hadrosaurid skull. So he took the skull to the University of Vienna and his professor told him to go figure out what it was. <laughs> it's not clear why he did that, maybe for learning or maybe lack of funding, I don't know. But not much was known about dinosaurs at that time, so he started comparing them to lizards and alligators to figure out how the jaw worked. And he also suggested that dinosaurs brooded, and this is based on him watching birds, and that they may have taken care of their babies. He published over 150 scientific papers and identified five dinosaurs, including Telmontosaurus, Zalmoxus, Struthiosaurus, and Magyarosaurus, but his name is rarely mentioned in textbooks. 
All these dinosaurs he identified are very different sizes and people thought that he had discovered juveniles. But Nopska believed that they were adults. He had sliced bones and studied the cell structure and could see that they were older. Kind of like how you count rings on a tree. And he said that some of them were small because of island dwarfism, which research after his death supported. So a lot of concepts that we talk about on this show, and he was talking about this as early as the 1800s. He unfortunately suffered from manic depression, though it was known as shattered nerves at the time. It's not completely clear why more people don't know about his work, but it could be because he was so eccentric he was, quote, fated to be an outsider scientist, or the fact that he never went to the U.S. or Canada during the dinosaur rush, so, quote, his work never reached a critical mass, end quote. Yeah, that kind of makes sense, especially because some of the other dinosaur scientists were pretty loopy, too, so yeah, I don't think that alone would do it. Also, if you didn't find any of the really exciting dinosaurs, you know, like he never found a huge sauropod or a big carnivore or something like that. It's hard to make a name for yourself. Yeah, but that still doesn't explain why even in his home country, he's not well known. True. Yeah. So after World War I, his family lost most of their money and he had to sell his fossils. And he ended up committing suicide in 1933 after shooting his friend Bahazid Almaz Doda who's a young Albanian man that he hired back in 1906 to be his secretary, and there were rumors that they were more than friends, which was another speculation of why he wasn't well-known. But Jeez. some people thought that didn't really matter in terms of why he wasn't well-known. But Not a lot of paleontologists going out and murder suicides. That's a little intense. Well, he suffered from manic depression. So. Yeah. Today and over the last five years... Dacian Muntian and his partner Laura Vesa have been working to make Novska's name known in Deva, the city where he was born. And some people in Romania are working to shine more light on dinosaurs in the country through museums. Deva has placed an anatomically correct replica of Magyarosaurus stachys, a dwarf sauropod, and one of the ones Novska had identified in front of a building that will hopefully become a museum with Transylvanian dinosaurs. And they hired a Canadian artist to build the replica and launched a successful Kickstarter campaign to pay for the shipping costs. In the meantime, Romania has Dino Park Raznov, which is the only park of its kind in Romania and the largest dinosaur park in Southeast Europe, according to Romania Insider. And this park is in Raznov, and it had 350,000 visitors in its first year of being open since last year, and it's helped bring more tourists to the area. The park has 46 accurate dinosaurs to take pictures with, as well as playgrounds, tree houses, and a cinema. Oh, that's cool. Mm Mm-hmm. In another part of the world, Mashable published this two-part feature about dinosaurs in the outback of Australia. So, in southwest Queensland, there has been more of an interest in dinosaur fossils, partly to attract more tourists to the area. And one family, Stuart and Robin McKenzie and their son Sandy, we've actually talked about them and their museum, but I'll get to that in a minute. They found their first dinosaur fossil in 2004 when Sandy was 14, and they've been excavating fossils on their property ever since and have one of the largest fossil collections in Australia. In 2014, this family started building the Aromanga Natural History Museum in Aromanga, Australia, and one of the dinosaurs they found is nicknamed Cooper, a new but not yet named sauropod genus that lived in the late Cretaceous and that is up to 98 feet or 30 meters long and maybe one of the 10 largest dinosaurs that we know about. I'm pretty sure we've mentioned Cooper before on the show. Yeah, I think we talked about that museum too. Mm -hmm. So they've also found marsupial and crocodile fossils as well as fish, frogs, lizards, and small mammals. And they thought that scientists would be calling them about their finds, especially Cooper, but they never got any calls. So they decided, hey, we'll build a museum. And the paleontologist Scott Hucknell helped Robin learn how to manage a museum. And she now trains local volunteers to help prepare fossils. And this has helped bring a sense of community back to the area where the population has shrunk a lot due to a long 15-year drought. So another great example of how dinosaurs bring people together. Yeah, that's cool. In the UK, in Chester, the city center, or downtown there, is opening up two citywide dinosaur trails to celebrate Chester Zoo's summer dinosaur exhibit. Displays of dinosaur fossils and cave finds found in the area are on display in 10 businesses as part of the Dino Chester Trail. So visitors can pick up a map at the visitor center, and then they can see bones, a footprint, and a replica T-Rex skull. And the second trail is called Dino Chester Jurassic Facts, and that includes dinosaur fossils on display in 40 businesses. 
And so they're encouraging families to find the names of 10 dinosaurs that are hiding in those businesses. And in exchange, you get a chance to win an annual family pass to the zoo. And the trails will be open until September 4th. And over the summer, every weekend and Thursday evenings, there will be a lifelike T-Rex from the zoo making appearances in the city center. In comic book news, Natasha Bustos, one of the Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur comic book artists, gave an interview on Comics Beat, and she talked about the series. She said she met a DC comic editor at a comics convention in Barcelona, and then was hired to work on a story for Strange Sports Stories with Brandon Montclair, who is the co-creator of the Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur series. Marvel later called her to ask if she wanted to work on the Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur series. She doesn't talk too much about the dinosaur in the series, but she does mention that the girl character, Lunella Lafayette, is important and relatable and helps diversify gender and race in comics. And the series already has eight issues, and there will be a ninth issue coming out at the end of July. We mentioned the game Horizon Zero Dawn in an earlier episode, which is going to be a PlayStation exclusive coming out sometime soon. And they just made a robot dinosaur based on the character Watcher in the game. And I think it's called Watcher because in the game it kind of functions as a guard and it looks pretty cool. So they decided to make like a full life-size real-life puppet for it. (laughs) And it's pretty similar to the setup of one of those juvenile T-Rex costumes that we've seen so many times in the past. And it's a similar size. It's about 15 feet or 6 meters long and about 6 feet or 2 meters tall. And then the puppeteer's legs stick out of the bottom of the costume and you kind of wear it like a huge backpack, I guess. (laughs) Obviously, since it's supposed to be a robot, other than the size and shape, it's quite a bit different than a normal dinosaur puppet. It's got some hard white plastic panels for a head and kind of the center section of the body above the legs. And then the neck and tail look like a big mass of cables and mechanical pieces. It looks much heavier. Yeah. Well, I think it's probably just painted plastic over foam. So it might actually be a little bit lighter than a dinosaur. It's kind of hard to tell. It also has a screen at the front that reminds me of Eve in Wally with that. Eva. Yeah. <laughs> with the blue lights for a face. But in this case, they can also turn orange and red, I guess depending on its mood or something. And then the puppeteer can lower the head really close to the ground or pop it up pretty high in the air (laughs) and make little sounds and stuff to give it some emotion. There are a couple of cool videos where they show the creators of the game meeting it for the first time and it like runs out of the shrubbery to pop up and scare the crap out of a couple of them. Nice. Hopefully in the game, they'll make some more cool looking dinosaur inspired machines, but we'll have to wait and see. It seems complicated to make. Yeah. I was surprised they did all that. What well, was for uh, E3? It was oh, a big they, deal. They actually had the puppet out there? Mm hmm. Oh, okay. That's cool. Speaking of costumes, in Alabama, this poor 15 year old girl got her head stuck in a Barney costume. And she put it on as a prank to scare her friends at a sleepover, but the last time she had worn the costume, she was in seventh grade and smaller. (laughs) So the costume's neck hole slid down to her elbows, and neither she nor her friends could pull it off. Eventually, they had to drive to a local fire department, where the firefighters made some small cuts at the base of the head and freed the girl. She was stuck in the costume for about 45 minutes, long enough to get sweaty and for her arms to start hurting. Also long enough for her friends to take pictures and videos and for the firefighters to laugh a little bit. (laughs) So this girl, her name's Darby, ended up going viral with all these memes and a search term, quote, stuck in Barney. (laughs) So if you're bored, just Google stuck in Barney. I'm sure you'll find some interesting pictures. (laughs) And last, according to the Wall Street Journal, Coach had a really awesome sounding party at the Highline Park in New York City, and it was dinosaur themed. So they had T-Rex topiaries. It was their sixth annual summer event, and they also had some flower crown making stands, photo booths, and Rexy, the coach mascot, which you can see Rexy on Megan Trainer's custom varsity bomber jacket from last fall, I guess. Huh. Yeah. I didn't realize coach had a mascot, and I definitely wouldn't expect it to be a dinosaur. Dinosaurs are becoming fashionable, I guess. I guess so. And now we'll jump into our interview with Scott Persons. 
Scott Persons has a master's degree in evolution and systematics from the University of Alberta, and he still works there researching dinosaur biomechanics and evolution. He works for Dr. Philip J. Curry, who we interviewed back in episode four. He has been on many dinosaur digs, and he currently studies dinosaur locomotion. The way I found out about his work is that he presents all of the University of Alberta massive open online courses that came out this year, at least in the paleontology department, and he did a really amazing job, so I wanted to talk to him. Well, thank you very much. So on Coursera, where you presented those MOOCs, it lists you as a dinomaniac since the age of two and a half. So what first got you interested in dinosaurs? Okay, so I'm told I've been interested in dinosaurs since I was two and a half. I don't, I don't actually remember it that far back. Uh, but the story goes that it all began in Las Vegas, where my dad was on a, a business trip, a, a, a legitimate business trip, <laughs> and uh, he wanted to bring me back something. And there weren't a lot of child-friendly venues in Vegas <laughs> at the time. But what there was was a place called the Desert Museum, and he went there while he was in Vegas. And like all good museums, he was forced to exit through the gift shop. And there in the gift shop, he found a very small paperback book entitled The Big Little Dinosaur. It's a story about uh, a baby sauropod, a baby long neck. And he brought that book home and I had him read it to me and read it to me again, again, and again, and apparently I was just hooked from there. It's a great story. It's got a whole Jurassic cast of characters. There's sort of a smart alecky a pterosaur. There's a very heroic stegosaur, and then the big villain is a purple allosaurus. Oh, cool. It's interesting they picked an allosaurus rather than the typical T-Rex. <laughs> yeah, they kept, kept it uh, Jurassic. Yeah, that's rare, actually, that people realize dinosaurs didn't all coexist in one big, crazy hodgepodge. <laughs> right. So do you have a favorite dinosaur? Is it one of the ones from that book? No. So I like to say that my favorite dinosaur will be the one that I discover. But right now, my favorite dinosaur, if I have to pick just one, is an individual we call Hannah. Okay. That name is familiar. Is that a Styracosaurus? That is a Styracosaurus question mark. Okay. <laughs> so so Hannah is a, it's a particular individual. It's a skeleton that I found uh, last summer in the Dinosaur Park formation. And when we first found her, and we found it nose first, so the horn was just poking up uh, out of the sediment, uh, got the whole skull, and uh, we first thought it was going to be actually a, a centrosaur, so another kind of horned dinosaur, because of the shape of some of the uh, ornaments on the frill, just as you get to the very, very back of it, so just as you reach the, the shield. Mm -hmm. um, looked very much so like a centrosaurus, but then as we continued to work around the skull, we found these great big spikes, the classic styracosaurus <laughs> horn dew sticking out there at the back. It became very, very clear that it was a strange critter that mostly looks like a Styracosaurus, but it's got those few odd horn ornamentations that seem more in line with, with Centrosaurus. So right now we're thinking it's probably Styracosaurus. Maybe, possibly, it's a different species of Styracosaurus. Uh, who knows, it's Ceratopsians. You might try to split that up even as far as a, a genus level. Maybe it turns out this is a critter that helps to bridge an evolutionary gap between Centrosaurus and Styracosaurus. But we, we really don't know yet. We're continuing to excavate Hannah. Gotcha. I think last week we were talking to Dr. David Hone. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, so you know about his zoology background, I guess. Yep. And I asked him, how come there are so few dinosaur genus even predicted? And he pointed out, well, when you're doing paleontology, it's a lot harder to break down the nuance between species. So it makes me think maybe that one that you found will eventually be classified as something we already have by some people and other people might say, well, it's actually a bridge specimen in between them. I keep seeing that debate over and over again. The lumpers and the splitters. Yeah, yeah I like that, lumpers and splitters. So another area you did some research was near Glen Rock, Wyoming. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, so Glen Rock, Wyoming, that's with the, the Paleon Museum in Glen Rock, which is a really cool place. Cool. There are some T-Rex tracks there 
that you looked at and you kind of worked on determining its speed? Can you talk a little bit about how that worked? Sure, sure. So I did not find these tracks. These tracks were found by the Glenrock Paleon Museum's head paleontologist, mm-hmm. Sean Smith. And they are a short series of tracks. They're in the Lance Formation, so they're latest Cretaceous. They're big, so they've they're probably going they they, they probably are Tyrannosaur question mark. <laughs> and they're they're a little bit too small to be an adult T Rex. So they may be a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex, or speaking of lumpers and splitters, maybe they belong to a critter called Nanotyrannus, which mm-hmm. a lot of people think is just a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. But yeah, so we've got a whole series of tracks there. And what's neat about it is because you've got a left-right-left pattern of tracks, you can do a rough calculation of how fast the, the animal is moving. And this is not a, a dinosaur that's racing. It doesn't record a running Tyrannosaur by any means. But it, it's cool to give a sort of a baseline for how the animal is walking. And one neat thing that seems to show is that for their size, Tyrannosaurs are taking, as most median dinosaurs were, relatively longer steps than equivalently sized ornithopods. So the Glenrot trackway shows that these Tyrannosaurs are at least walking faster than, uh, than the duck-billed dinosaurs that they were hunting were walking. Yeah, so I think I read somewhere that we've found several tracks of tyrannosaurs walking, but prints of running don't really fossilize well or maybe just aren't common enough. Yeah, they're just not very common. So there are a number of factors that play into that. And really here we can talk not just about tyrannosaurs, but we can talk about dinosaurs in general. We just don't have very many uh, convincing running tracks for dinosaurs. A couple of reasons for that. Um, one is you know, strictly a probability argument, right? Think about the amount of time you spend or an animal spends walking versus the amount of time that they spend running, right? You're running for only very short periods of time. So just the odds are, you know, if you're going to find an animal's tracks, it's going to be doing what it's normally doing, which is, is walking. And then added on top of that is the fact that in order for you to get tracks preserved, right, you need to be walking on a sediment surface that's conducive to preserving footprints. So usually that means walking on very soft, squishy sediments. Yeah. When you're moving on soft, squishy stuff, you know, normally you're not you're not trying to run, right? You may even be walking slower than you normally would because you're being careful not to slip or to get stuck. Makes sense. So do you know if there have been any running fossilized footprints? There have been some controversial ones. So the prime example of that are some uh, tracks that have been found down in Australia that are supposed to preserve possibly some dinosaurs running, possibly even a chase between a carnivorous dinosaur and it, and its prey. But there has been some recent controversy about that. <laughs> controversy always seems to pop up with new, exciting stuff. Absolutely. So you also describe Carnotaurus as having an exceptionally long, or a large, I guess maybe long, caudofemoralis muscle, which may have helped it sprint, but it may not have been able to turn very well. So what do you think it might have hunted, or how do you think it might have hunted? Yeah, so Carnotaurus is a really weird, really, really cool critter, and it's got the single most bizarre dinosaur tail I think I've ever seen. Uh, and that, that's including things like ankylosaurs and, and stegosaurs. So Carnotaurus's tail is is so bizarre because of what we can call the transverse processes or the, the caudal ribs. And so the tail, of course, is an extension of the backbone. So it's composed of a series of vertebrae. And uh, the, the caudal ribs are bones that stick out from the vertebrae, uh, usually to the side. So on any respectable median dinosaur's tail, you've got a nice long series of these ribs on either side. Mm-hmm. But on Carnotaurus, they get freaky. They point way the heck upward, so not so much out as up. And on the ends of these ribs, they've got these weird hooks to them. Hmm. So it looks like the dinosaur has almost got a row of question marks uh, running down its spine. And the way that those hooks, when you articulate the tail skeleton, they line up one directly behind the other, and they sort of overlap and make contact with the ones in front of and behind them. So you've got this tight interlocking series. And we also see some evidence on the lateral surface of those caudal ribs, giving us, we think, some indication of where the different muscles attached. 
And based on my research, looking at dissections of modern day reptiles, we think that the muscle that is most reasonably filling that space on the sides of the tail is a muscle called the caudofemoralis, which is actually a muscle that's tied to the leg. So it's a big muscle in the tail, but it's attached to the femur, the upper leg bone, by tendons, and when the muscle contracts, it pulls the leg backwards. Or if you're planting your foot and you're contracting that big caudofemoralis muscle, it's what's pulling your body forwards. It's what's giving you your power stroke. By angling the colorids upwards in Carnotaurus, you're expanding the size for this muscle, which implies Carnotaurus has got an increased locomotive oomph. It's just got <laughs> more power in its trunk, which, like a, a Volkswagen Beetle, is, is the engine. Mm -hmm. And so that presumably would give it more power, let it to run faster. When we say, I don't think it can turn particularly well, it's just because by having that tight interlocking series of tail vertebrae, it means your tail is less flexible and you probably have to turn the whole thing more as a unit, uh, which may increase your rotational inertia, may make it harder for you to pivot quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of what Carnotaurus was actually hunting, uh, that's that's a tricky question. <laughs> and we don't we don't have any good direct evidence of that. But one bit of, of speculation that we put forward in our paper describing Carnotaurus is that, you know, as, as with all bizarre dinosaur adaptations, this one didn't just pop into existence overnight. We see in some of uh, Carnotaurus's other South American relatives what we think is a fairly gradual progression leading up to this bizarre tail form. And during that time, at least when these ancestors of Carnotaurus were around, you know, some of them were coexisting with some of the great big predators of South America. So, so things like uh, Mapusaurus and Giganotosaurus, the really big guys. And we're thinking, well, maybe this represents a little bit of niche partitioning. So that is Carnotaurus and its ancestors might be becoming more specialized to run really fast and in turn both avoid being eaten by those other big super predators, but also maybe they're better at catching some of the smaller, faster critters. So maybe going after some of the abundant South American ornithopods and possibly maybe leaving the big sauropods there for Giganotosaurus and, uh, and its crew to tackle. Now, that being said, we don't have direct evidence of Carnotaurus itself coexisting with some of those other big predators, but that may very well just be a function of, of sample size because we really don't know a lot about the other animals that shared the particular environment, the particular point in time with Carnotaurus. So it makes Carnotaurus more like a cheetah and some of these other guys more like lions or something. Yeah, maybe that's a good comparison. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm also kind of surprised, like you mentioned the book that you had as a kid, that Carnotaurus doesn't pop up more as the big villain because it's even got like the horns and everything. So it does. It does. Well, Carnotaurus has been the villain in, in pop culture a little bit, right? If you think back to Disney's Dinosaur with the uh, with the iguanodons and the oh. big migration story, right? Yeah, Carnotaurus is the big bad. You're right. Uh, in that film. In fact, they make him uh, bigger and badder than, than the animal was, right? They blow <laughs> it up to the size of a tyrannosaur. Of course. So it has gotten to be villainous in, in that way. Carnotaurus also makes a cameo in the second Jurassic Park uh, novel where it's a scary critter lurking in the dark and it's got camouflage powers, I think. I'll have to reread that. It's been a long time since I read the Jurassic Park books. Do you think that it might have been the fastest large carnivore? Or do you think something more like a Dakota Raptor or something would have been quicker? Okay. So actually, I would argue to you, although the raptors, the dromaeosaurs at least, get a lot of publicity for being fast, mm -hmm. uh, thanks in large part to Jurassic Park. Actually, when you look at their limb proportions, most of them, so when you look at, say, the length of the lower leg, the length of the shin and the length of the metatarsal, so some of the foot bones, which count effectively as leg bones in these guys because of course they're standing on their toes so the foot is, is raised up and contributing to the length of the leg they're actually not that elongate they don't really have the legs of a sprinter i tend to think of the classic raptor dinosaurs of the dromaeosaurs as maybe being more like wolves and, and coyotes in terms of their athleticism than like cheetahs or other big cats that are that are really, really good sprinters. Now, if I had to bet, no, I probably wouldn't say uh, Carnotaurus 
even among the, the big theropods, was necessarily the fastest. We don't have a complete lower leg uh, for Carnotaurus, so it's, it's a little hard to say that. Hmm. Maybe it does. Maybe when we find the, the full leg, it'll, it'll surprise all of us. But you might want to, if you have to go out to the Dino Derby and place a bet, <laughs> you might go probably for a uh, small, medium-sized Tyrannosaur, actually, okay. of, of the big predators, because they've got really, really long legs. Tyrannosaurs are super, super leggy. They're sort mm -hmm. of the Radio City Rockettes of the dinosaur <laughs> world. Have you talked at all to the group that's making the game Saurian at all? Uh, no, I haven't. They describe T-Rex in almost the exact same way as just, they say Sue has legs for days and she can just run so <laughs> fast super easily. Cool. So other than running ability or perhaps, you know, how quickly they can change direction, what else can we learn about dinosaur locomotion from fossils? Okay. So as I said, a big part of my work uh, focuses on looking at dinosaur muscles and trying to figure out from the skeletons where they're attached. Mm -hmm. And as far as we've talked about looking at just the proportions of the limbs uh, as they relate to speed and also looking at the size of the tail muscle. One other thing that I look at, which is a, sort of a, a combination of those two, is trying to think a little bit about the leverage involved in the, the muscle and skeletal system. So, for instance, one cool topic that uh, my advisor, Dr. Phil Curry, and I have tried to tackle is the mystery of the successful duckbill dinosaurs. Hmm. So if we imagine a video game, right, where we get to travel back to the Hell Creek, the most common dinosaur I would imagine that they have you encounter is probably going to be, at least of the big ones, is going to be a duckbill. Because mm -hmm. duckbills are like everywhere. In, in North America, at least, they easily outnumber all the other kinds of, of big dinosaurs. They're really, really successful, which is also really, really weird because, I mean, as a, as a video game character goes, it would seem like duckbill dinosaurs would be like the safest thing you could try to attack, right? Like that's like level one. It's, it's just a duckbill. It doesn't have horns, doesn't have, uh, doesn't have armor. And for big animals, that's something that's really weird. So there's this idea in modern ecology and thinking about the evolution of ecosystems that says, you know, as an animal gets larger, as it increases in body size, its environment becomes progressively more two-dimensional. Hmm. Okay, because, you know, if you're a really, really big animal, there are fewer objects in the environment that are, number one, an obstacle for you, right? Mm -hmm. Everything gets progressively flatter. You know, there's very few things that you cannot cross, that you cannot simply step over if you're the size of a, of a big dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that has implications for predator avoidance strategies, right? If you're a, a little critter, then your world is filled with rocks and bushes and grass and things that you can hide behind. You've got the option, you can burrow and make your own hidey hole, you can climb up trees and things like that. If you were a big dinosaur, those really weren't options for you. And so strategies based on like crypsis and concealment, so hiding from your predators, that probably doesn't work because they, they can see you, you just, there's no place to hide. And so you need more direct methods for dealing with your predators. And uh, we see that today if we look at big megafauna, like in Africa, for example, right? You see a couple of different strategies. You can do what elephants do. You can just get to be so big uh, that a predator can't tackle you, certainly not one-on-one. -on -one. You can be uh, a warrior, like a cape buffalo or a rhinoceros. You can develop a big weapon that makes it uh, dangerous for a predator to try to muck with you. Uh, you can be uh, a fortress, like a, a crested porcupine or a giant ground pangolin, so you're so well-armored and pointy that, again, you've got no vulnerable spot. Uh, or you can be a, a speedster, right? Like a gazelle, an antelope. You can match your predator step for step and, uh, and make it so they can't catch you. Mm -hmm. If we look back on dinosaurs, we see a lot of parallels, right? We've got huge sauropods. They're giants. We've got ceratopsians, which certainly seem to be taking the warrior strategy. You've got some fortresses in, in the case of the big ankylosaurs. Obviously, you've got speedsters for some of the really small ornithopods or the ornithomimids. And, of course, your big predators in that scenario would be the tyrannosaurs. But duckbill dinosaurs, they don't seem to fit into any of those, right? <laughs> They're not super big, most of them at least. They overlap with the size of their predators. They don't have great big horns. They don't have uh, armor. They're certainly not fortresses. And the question is, well, okay, 
are they are they speedsters? Can they be as fast as their predators? Well, when you look at the length of a duckbill dinosaur's leg, turns out, no, it's much shorter. The same size as Montosaurus got much shorter leg than the same size Tyrannosaurus. Uh, it doesn't look like they could outrun them. But one thing my research suggests is that the attachment site for the caudofemoralis is really, really high up on the femur. It attaches very high up on the Tyrannosaur. That's great for high-speed running, right? You have it attached high up, so a very short contraction of the muscle is enough to swing the leg back and forth through one entire power stroke. So very quickly, contract, 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 contract. Your Tyrannosaur can uh, swing its leg very, very quickly. Great for sprinting. Cool. In a duckbill dinosaur, though, it's attached really, really far down. So you've got a slow contraction or else very short steps. Again, that parallels what we see in the dinosaur footprint record. Duckbill dinosaurs taking shorter steps. That makes you slower. But... By positioning it further down, right, you're extending the moment arm. You're giving yourself a lot more leverage mm -hmm. for that muscle, right? It's like imagine a door. You put your door handle far away from the hinge, makes it nice and easy to open it. If you put it really, really close to the hinge, oh, you got to really work in order to swing the door open. Same thing would be true for these dinosaurs and their legs. So the idea is, well, whether or not a tyrannosaur can catch a duckbill dinosaur might really depend on what kind of a race you're running. In a short sprint, short. The Tyrannosaur can overtake it easy, but if it's a long race, if the duckbill dinosaur sees you coming from a distance, well, then it can run and run, and you'll gain on it for the first little while, but then, oh, your caudofemoralis is going to be aching and burning, <laughs> and the duckbill dinosaur with its superior leverage, you know, it's uh, slow but steady, would win that race. <laughs> And indeed, if you then apply that back to our African analog, you see that, well, what's the number one reasonably sized herbivore that you often encounter on the plains of the Serengeti? Well, it's things like zebra and wildebeest. And a zebra is a fast critter, can do 30, 35 miles per hour, but a lion can do 50. Cheetahs, which do attack zebras, can do 60 and up. So those big cats are faster, but the zebra has got superior endurance such that the cat can only overtake them if they get into a very, very narrow striking distance. Mm. Now imagine you're a duckbill dinosaur. You're not having to be on the lookout for a stealthy cat moving through the tall grass. Instead, you're on the lookout for a predator that's literally the size of a billboard sign, and you're a herding animal, so you've got multiple eyes and ears and noses all on the alert for a predator and with the ability to alert you if they're spotted. So we would argue that an endurance-based strategy might be very, very viable for duckbill dinosaurs, and maybe that was at least partially key to their success and certainly for their continued survival alongside tyrannosaurs. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, maybe maybe in the video game, the duckbill dinosaurs aren't even a, an animal you get to interact with. Maybe they're just sort of a background critter that runs away as soon as you get close and you never make any progress. Yeah, because sneaking up as a T-Rex is going to be a little tricky. Yep. So you were involved in the discovery of the Romeo and Juliet, in air quotes, uh, find, <laughs> which is believed to be a mating pair of oviraptors. Can you tell us a little bit about what you did there? So I, I should I should clarify. So first of all, I was definitely not involved in the, the discovery of those specimens. I was not even on the same continent. They were found in, in Mongolia. What my role has been is that after a bunch of, of hardworking folks found the specimens, cleaned them up, and uh, brought them for study at the American Museum of Natural History, I was one of, of many researchers that was allowed to come in and have a look at them and study them. So as background goes, yeah, Romeo and Juliet are a pair of oviraptorosaurs. They were found very, very close together. They're beautifully preserved. It looks like they may have died in the same event. Maybe they got buried as a big sand dune came down over top of them. So it looks like they died almost in each other's arms. And so that gave them the nickname Romeo and, and Juliet. It was actually one of a couple of nicknames they got. They were also nicknamed uh, Sid and Nancy and also <laughs> Batman and Robin. Uh, but Romeo and Juliet was the name that really, really stuck because it conjures up the image of, oh, what a tragic death of these two dinosaurs that maybe they were in love. Okay, so what I did was I was interested in tails. And although these two critters are, uh, are basically identical in every regards, uh, the one that's named Romeo is, is, is slightly larger, but they're basically identical except 
when you go to look at their tails. So the, the tail vertebrae are, are very different, as are the chevrons. And chevrons are little tail bones that stick down below. And in the specimen that's nicknamed Juliet, she's got a fairly standard series of chevrons. Uh, oviraptors tend to have very, very uh, flexible tails. They're actually uh, pretty beefy tails, too. But she's basically a par for the course. Wasn't a big surprise. But then when you look at Romeo, he's got these chevrons that really start to change shape very radically as you move past the base of the tail. And it develops this almost spearhead-like shape to it which I took as an indication of, wow, what a strong attachment point for some muscles you've got going on there. Those caudal ribs are actually proportionately longer in Romeo as well. And the reason that we can think about maybe relating tales to romance in Ophiraptorosaurs is because many of them have got what we call a, a pygo style. So a series of fused vertebrae right there at the tip of the tail, which is something you also see in birds. And we think that those pygo styles were there to support a fan of feathers. So a little bit like the, the fans of feathers that you see in, in modern day birds. And we know from a critter called Caudipteryx, uh, actually pr preserved in China, one of the specimens, the beautiful ash fall specimens, where you actually physically see the fan of tail feathers. So we know these critters have got this structure. And if you think about what modern day birds with big fans of feathers do with them when they're not using them to help them fly, and indeed these oviraptorosaurs are, are flightless, uh, one common function is that you use them as a sexual display structure, right? You flaunt them, you flash them in mating dances, you use them to attract the opposite gender. And of course, as is often the case, these sexual signaling devices tend to be sexually dimorphic, meaning they're bigger, they're more exaggerated in one sex than in the other. And of course, because it's usually the males that have to do the advertising, it's to the males that the onus of doing the mating dances, of doing the convincing that that responsibly falls to, it tends to be the males that have got a more elaborate display structure. So when we saw that these two dinosaurs seemed to show what might be sexual dimorphism in their tails, we figure most likely the one that's got the butcher tail, the one that seems better adapted to swing and flaunt and wave its tail about is most likely the male. As it happens, that's the one that did get the nickname of Romeo. So we suggest that, yeah, you know, Romeo and Juliet may in fact be a male-female pair. Maybe this really is the tragic dinosaur love story that the press originally made it out to be. Cool. Yeah, that's sometimes not the case that the press jumps on a cool title. Oh, yeah. Especially whenever tyrannosaurs get involved, but... So one other paper that I found really interesting is on Sinocalyopteryx. Oh, yes. And the paper describes it as likely a stealth hunter. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what clues there were for that conclusion? Sure, sure. Okay, so Sinocalyopteryx is a, a very cool critter from China. Um, it is related to a very small Silurosaurian dinosaurs, um, although it's actually fairly large for its group. So it, it's pushing wolf size. And the reason that we, there was discussion about it being a stealth hunter is because inside the, uh, the preserved rib cage of some Sinocalyopteryx specimens, we find the remains of some early primitive birds. Inside the specimen of another one, we actually found the leg of a raptor, a little raptor, so a relative of like micro raptor. And these are critters that have got uh, wings. In the case of the birds, they're certainly at least critters that were capable of flight. And so that's sort of an unusual prey choice for a land-bound predator to be going after, apparently with some regularity, right? Multiple instances uh, show these kinds of prey preserved. Based on that, we suggest, well, maybe we can compare Sinocalyopteryx to some modern day predators that are good at catching prey that can fly. So that's something that, say, foxes do. Obviously, that's something uh, that a lot of cats do. And uh, the way they do that is they're really, really good at sneaking up stealthily and then pouncing on their prey before they see them and they're able to take off. And so since Sinocalyopteryx seems to have an abnormal preference for flighty prey, uh, we suggest that maybe it was particularly good at that. Okay, so just looking at the stomach contents alone, you can kind of draw the conclusion you didn't have to look too much at 
I guess it helps that it's small, probably. It helps that it's relatively small. If we think about the limb proportions of Sinocholiopteryx, actually, it's got a really, really long uh, lower leg. It was also a, a pretty fast critter. Hmm. So you can definitely imagine it finding its feathery prey and then sprinting in a big lunge or a big pounce to nab it. Okay, very cool. One other dinosaur study question that I have for you is you have talked a little bit about a non-avian theropod swimming in China, and we saw a similar track that came out of the UK for a stegosaurus recently. Mm -hmm. What do you think would make a dinosaur want to swim, or where would they be swimming? Okay. So I tell you, you know, when I was growing up, one of the big, you know, big dinosaur movie way before Jurassic Park was, of course, The Land Before Time. Mm -hmm. That's probably our favorite. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, you remember the big climax in The Land Before Time is when Littlefoot and his posse make the big stand against Sharptooth the Tyrannosaur. Mm -hmm. And the way they defeat him is they just sort of knock him into a puddle. And they say it's so deep down there, he won't be able to swim with those scrawny little arms. And for a long time, there's sort of this idea that, uh, you know, unless a dinosaur had clear adaptations or what we thought were clear adaptations for being able to swim, you know, they're landbound critters. They didn't go into the water and they maybe Tyrannosaurus rex and whatnot couldn't even swim. That's actually a pretty silly thing to think, <laughs> uh, I would argue. If you look at modern day critters, uh, even, even animals that mostly hang out on land, if you put them in water, uh, they float. They're perfectly capable of swimming. Some of them may actively try to avoid the water, but there are also plenty of uh, like big mammals today that are perfectly happy to go for uh, a swim. Mm -hmm. And there are many reasons why they might choose to do that. It could be as simple as this, ah, oh, we need to cross this river, this body of water to get to the other side. It may be, you know, it's nice to take a nice ref a refreshing dip. Uh, maybe it's good for getting rid of uh, parasites. Maybe it's just a, a good way to, uh, to, to cool off. So I actually imagine that a lot of dinosaurs uh, had many reasons, many opportunities to get their feet wet to go for a nice little swim. And even though Tyrannosaurus, right, has got those tiny little, little arms, you know, it's got huge lungs. It would be very, very buoyant. It would be hard to sink a Tyrannosaur. Plus, it's got giant feet, really powerful legs. The animals could certainly uh, could certainly swim. It could do the sort of duck paddle, which is what we think some of those tracks show us of the dinosaur just touching bottom and scratching along as it moves. And of course, it's also got the, the great big tail that it could certainly you move from side to side to help propel it through the water. So I don't think you could kill a, a Tyrannosaur by dropping it in the water. <laughs> So are most of these swimming tracks really that transitional where they go from walking to clawing a little bit at the surface as they're starting to float? Yeah. So, I mean, and, and that's not surprising, right? Because the only place where you could get a swimming track is when the dinosaur is just beginning to start to swim. Because after that, it's just paddling through the water and the water won't fossilize to, to give you a track. So where you tend to get it is right where you're, uh, you're moving in to the deep end. That's amazing to me, especially considering it's so hard to find running tracks, but we can find these swimming tracks periodically. Sure, sure. So, and and, and that, that, again, relates to the kind of environment, right? You need to have a, a somewhat wet, moist sediment for you to get a track that gets to be preserved. And, of course, you have those around watery environments, and watery environments are also where you're, you're going for a swim. So that really increases the, the probability of it. Cool. Do you have any plans for making more paleontology MOOCs or maybe now that you're an official doctor or somebody else is taking that over? Or? We do actually have some plans to do some uh, quick revisions, maybe add in a few things, touch on some stuff we either didn't get a chance to do or didn't get a chance to do justice to. So there are some uh, revisions, some updates, additions to the, uh, the paleo MOOCs uh, that are scheduled. Currently, though, there are no big plans that uh, that I'm involved with for the moment. But, you know, they've just come out. There's going to be a period of time of waiting to see how they're, they're received. They are great and Thank probably you. the best MOOCs I've taken. So excellent work. Thank you. That's great to hear. Yeah, I, I often recommend it on the course for everybody to go take the Dino 101 and the early theropod. Theropods and the origins of birds. Yep. Yes. I also took the other ones, even though they're not about dinosaurs, just because you did such a good job. Thank you. So uh, one final question. Okay. We're going to be visiting the Philip J. Curry Museum and the Royal Terrell Museum in a couple weeks on a big oh, cool. road trip. Now, you've, you've been before, right? To, to the Royal Terrell, I mean. 
We haven't been at all, which is... You haven't? Oh my gosh. Well, you're in for a treat. Is there anything in particular that we should know about or anything? Mm, I tell you what, when you go through the very first gallery Mm -hmm. at the Royal Tyrell Museum, once you come out of the beautiful room that's got these life-size albertosaurs, you'll enter into what looks sort of like an art gallery almost. In fact, the skeletons are behind little, little portraits in the wall. And you'll come to two beautiful death pose skeletons. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of them is a juvenile Gorgosaurus. The other one is an Ornithomimid. And they're gorgeous, and you'll be blown away with the Gorgosaurus teeth and its claws. Pay attention to the back end. Have a look at the tail. And have a look at the chevrons. Again, those little bones that stick down on the underside. And see if you can spot the point where those chevrons begin to change their shape. So they'll go from looking like elongate finger-like projections up to more sort of a a boat shape to them. Hmm. And right when you see that transition, you'll be able to see a little series of, of scars, of little ridges running down the surface of those chevrons. And that, as I've argued in the literature before, may very well represent the point where that caudofemoralis muscle, the big muscle that was powering that juvenile gorgosaur and that ornithomimus as they were running and sprinting through the Cretaceous landscape, you can see the point where it begins to taper out and some of the other muscle moves in to take over its position. So look for that. I will. Now that you're a doctor, I'm sure you have a very bright future and I'm excited to see the first dinosaur that you get to name. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for having me on the podcast. That was a great interview, so thanks again, Scott. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Or should we say Dr. Scott? And Scott sent us a neat three-minute video that the University of Alberta made about discovering and airlifting out Scott's favorite dinosaur, Hannah. And there's also another quick video that shows the introduction to the theropod dinosaurs and the origin of birds course that we mentioned during the interview. And if you want to follow him, you can go to at WScottPersons on Twitter. And you can grab all those links from our blog or in the episode notes. Before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we have one more word from our sponsor, Audible. You can get a free audiobook by going to audibletrial.com slash inodino. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash inodino. And once you're there, you can search for Brontosaurus and you can find our book. Or you can look for any other books you might be interested in when we're going on this road trip that we're magically on right now while you're listening to this, most likely, is going to be filled slash is filled with lots of audiobooks. And we're going to be re-listening to the Jurassic Park and Lost World books, which are both available on Audible. So if you'd like to check out those books or any other books, you can go to audibletrial.com slash inodino And we'll get the credit for sending you there, and you can keep all of the books, even if you cancel the service after the first free month. Good deal. Yep. And now for our dinosaur of the day, Shishiosaurus. And this is not to be confused with Shishionicus, an alvarosaur from the same formation in China. So the name Shishiosaurus means Henan Shishia lizard, and it's from the Henan province in Shishia County. Who could have guessed? Mm Mm-hmm. This kind of speaks to David Hone's point about it's always place name Asaurus, place name Ensis. What happens when you find two dinosaurs in the same place? Yes. It was a Trudontid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now China, and it was described in 2010 by Chinese scientists from the Chinese Academy of Geological Sciences in Beijing and the Henan Geological Museum in Henan. Their paper was published in... Acta Paleontologica Polonica, and it was called A New Trudontid Theropod from the Late Cretaceous of Central China and the Radiation of Asian Trudontids. And the fossils were found at the Shishia Basin. They found a mostly complete skull, which resembles Byronosaurus, a Trudontid from the Late Cretaceous in what is now Mongolia. And both these dinosaurs have no serrations on their teeth. And it was very bird-like. It was estimated to be 3.9 feet or 1.2 meters long, and it had good hearing and a good sense of smell. It was very smart. It had one of the highest encephalization quotients of non-avian dinosaurs. The skull found is nearly complete, except for the posterior portion, so part of the brain case is also missing. 
but it's a long skull and also similar to Byronosaurus, and it had 22 maxillary teeth. Shishiosaurus had fewer maxillary teeth than Byronosaurus, which had at least 30, but it still had more teeth than most other theropods. Trudontids were probably carnivorous based on their teeth, though in 1998, Holtz et al. suggested that they may have been herbivores because the size of the serrations on their teeth were more similar to other herbivores than carnivores, but this is not widely accepted. The lack of serrations on Shishiosaurus and Byronosaurus show their food sources may have changed, as they could no longer slice meat with their teeth. So maybe Shishiosaurus was an herbivore, or it could have been an omnivore. Again, Shishiosaurus is a trudontid, and trudontidae is a group of bird-like theropods. They've been found in the northern hemisphere only, North America, Europe, and Asia. The largest one was Trudon, and the smallest was Inchiornis, at least as far as we know. They have closely spaced teeth in the lower jaw, sickle-like claws, and they were pretty advanced. They also had long legs, large brains and large eyes, and a good sense of hearing. And they had asymmetrical ears, so one was higher on the skull, like owls, which means that they may have hunted in a way similar to owls, using hearing to find prey. Yeah, that's such a cool adaptation. Mm Mm-hmm. And our fun fact of the day is super short this week. I mentioned Enantiornithians earlier when I was talking about the bird wings that were in amber, and it's likely that they lived in colonial nesting sites, but unlike many modern birds, they may have buried their eggs. Hmm. So they're kind of a combination of different features. Interesting. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And if you want to join our community of dinosaur enthusiasts, then please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.